Hi, everyone. Welcome to Heart Health with Michelle. We're back again with Dr. Julia Kogan, and this time we are discussing medical stress and medical trauma and how we can address it. This includes, you know, when you have anxiety over either a family history of heart disease or you've had a medical event and it caused medical trauma or stress in your life, how do we address it so that it's not harboring and causing more complications in the future? So I'm going to have uh, Dr. Julia Kogan tell us a little bit about herself before um, we dive into to that segment. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And so I am a health psychologist with a background in in neuropsychology. So I am I work with people to address any kind of additional factors that might be impacting their health, their medical conditionings, just their overall well being um, related to their lifestyle, poorly managed stress, sleep issues, anything else that might be impacting our health. Um, so I have kind of been fortunate to see both sides of it in my work with health psychology and neuropsychology. Um, the health psychology piece, trying to catch people in the earlier phases of some of these things going on so we can see what we can do to help them prevent uh, or manage different kinds of medical conditions. And then the, the neuropsychology side is really open to my eyes to, you know, the, the things that can happen when certain medical conditions are not treated, when certain lifestyle factors um, have not been addressed in terms of risk for um, cardiovascular issues, cognitive issues. So the, the combination um, of the two has allowed me to work with people in, in a lot of different ways just to help them um, prevent and manage stress that might be getting in their way, poor sleep or anything else that might be negatively impacting their health. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. So this segment came about because I have a lot of clients who come to me and say, Michelle, I found out that I have a high CAC score. I have a lot of plaque in my arteries and I'm really nervous. Um, or someone who's had a family member pass away at an early age or who has seen just a lot of family history of heart disease. And there's a lot of this underlying stress around it. And I work with a lot of my clients to address it and empower them to take control and know the action points and really realize that we're reducing all risk factors, we're being proactive, and that helps ease a lot of it. But I would like to learn your perspective from, you know, the mind-body connection of how do we really address this? Because it's so prevalent, and I want to make sure that we are addressing it so people don't have that long-term anxiety and stress that can really cause a lot of pressure around the heart, cause an enlargement of the heart, heart failure, high blood pressure, and just further cardiovascular complications. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is a really important topic and certainly relevant to a lot of people. I think, you know, a good place to start is just um, remembering that, you know, health is not just physical health or emotional health. We really like to look at it, especially in health psychology as whole health. So these things are not separate. So um, it's not just, you know, your medical conditions, but it's also your lifestyle factors. What are you eating? Um, Any kind of substances you're using, your exercise, your stress levels, your sleep, you know, all of these different factors, how do these combine? Um, And so for people who have very, you know, valid concerns because of a family history or, you know, for other reasons, um, the parts that I'm going to really encourage you to focus on is um, really kind of trying to look at your health from a a whole health or holistic way. And also working with providers who are going to support you in that as well, um, whether that's your primary care doctor or other kinds of doctors. And I think a really good first step there is really just um, learning more. And so a lot of people that um, in my work in, in primary care, um, a lot of people, of course, you know, are familiar with various things, but the more you can um, kind of educate yourself through reputable sources. So that means your providers, you trust um, some internet information from highly reputable sources only, please. Uh, no web MDing ourselves. <laughs> Um, But I think really the first step is always going to be just understanding education. The more information you have, the better you're going to be able to take charge of your life in the ways that you can. Yeah. Um, So I would say that's the first step. Yeah. And I love, yeah. And I think that that's important to note a couple of notes. One is understand the why, understand what's going on. You can have plaque in your arteries, but it be stable and never cause any issues, but you want to learn how do I prevent it from becoming unstable and how do I prevent it from getting, promoting more plaque in my arteries, right? So understanding what that means, what the diagnosis means and what you can do is helpful in order to be more proactive and to ease some of those worries. But I do like the, how you mentioned, you have to know where you're getting those information from, because even in my field of science-based nutrition, there is over a hundred and different 
viewpoints and a lot of them have no science basis and a lot of it when you ask those people even doctors who are like you should be on a carnivore diet or you should be on a lesser than free diet when you ask them can you show me the research they look at you like you like the dumbfounded of no i can't so i always say even if they have an md or they're a chiropractor they are they have some healthcare professional what they're saying, A, does it make sense? B, where is the where is the why behind it? We can't just do anecdotal information when we're talking about your heart health. It doesn't, it's not going, you can't, general information is not necessarily applicable to you. And we need to make sure that it's specialized care and it's rep, reputable in many forms. So I love knowing, I love that you said you need to understand, but really dig deep and ask your healthcare professional, your primary care physician, your cardiologist, your lipidologist, ask questions. A lot of times people come to me and they have no idea what what, what their blood tests mean. They have no idea what even happened in their heart attack, that they had heart failure or they had any issues. They don't understand what exactly those things mean. And I'm very big about, we need to, you need to ask questions. You should, this is your body. This is you. You can't just rely it on other people. And that I think is a big component to reducing that anxiety. So I just wanted to add those things in. So I appreciate yeah. it. No, yeah. absolutely. And I think, in, and even beyond that, as you said, not just uh, knowing, you know, what would be helpful for me, but why are we doing it? Just as, as people, we have a tendency, we get so much information and you probably have heard tons of information already, but when it doesn't feel personally relevant to us and we don't really understand, okay, you're telling me to, I don't know, you know, get 30 minutes of physical activity a day, but why, what is that really helping me with? The more that we can understand that, why the more we're going to say, okay, yes, this makes sense. And it's also actually going to help us feel better when there are some of those concerns, because we actually know that there's kind of scientific research backed ways and we understand how that's going to help us. Yeah. Um, so yes, I would, I would very much agree with that. I mean, it also helps with long-term sustainability. When we know the why we're able to implement it in various settings, right? So it's like, okay, okay, if I do more cardiovascular exercise, I will strengthen my heart. I'll allow for good blood flow. There's a, there, I'll increase my metabolic rate. So when I'm home or when I'm on vacation or wherever I am, it's a priority because you know the impact it has for you and your health, especially if you're anxious about a certain health condition, this can help ease those areas of, okay, I check that off my box. I feel better from it. And I know I'm doing my body good. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree, agree more with that. So, you know, once you, you have that information and, and I think something else you said that's really important is don't be afraid to ask questions. People are very shy. I see this all the time in primary care to get further information. That's what all of your providers are there for. We would rather have you, you know, and I think I can speak for most of us, but, you know, understand what we're doing and have you do it, then leave the question, the, the clinic or, you know, setting saying like, I, don't know what they were talking about. So, you know, try not to be shy there. I know it can be a little bit um, kind of intimidating for some people, but I, a great way to get further information is to write down questions as they come to you. So then it's when you're going to your appointment, you can remember to ask them um, and, you know, kind of doing things that way. And once you have that information, now we can really focus on the things that we have some level of control over. So depending on, you know, what you have going on. So if we're talking about cardiovascular risk factors, you know, usually a lot of those risk factors are very much related to our life style. And this is a good thing because we have a lot of um, autonomy and, and power to take charge of our life in those ways. So things that we're going to want to look at that you're going to probably have, you know, more control over are, um, you know, your physical activity that makes sense for you. What are you eating? And this goes back to the understanding, you know, why certain foods might um, support, you know, a, a healthy physical and emotional health versus some other ones Our sleep, you know, are we getting proper sleep that's going to, you know, help support um, a healthy lifestyle, uh, managing and checking in with our stress levels. You know, that's the part that I think the stress and sleep sometimes are less addressed, um, but they're also extremely important. And that's where maybe that kind of non-traditional, totally just medical model um, is starting, hopefully in most places to be um, kind of over overcome with this whole health approach, because those are really important factors too. When we're not sleeping well, when we have poorly managed stress, these are all going to be risk factors for cardiovascular disease and a lot of other kinds of issues. So really focusing on the areas that we have some level of control over can be very empowering and also help reduce some of that anxiety about, okay, is, you know, is this going to be me next or what's going to happen to me? 
Oh, a hundred percent. And I love that. I think it's also super important to not just be like, Oh, well, I'm getting older or I'm doing this. So my sleep's not good. I only see this many hours. Like you need good quality of sleep and in sleep, there's so many prongs to it in terms of what could be the cause of poor quality or quantity. So we want to make sure that we are addressing that effectively um, and not really giving more weight to one versus the other. All of them do matter and we need to assess it. So a lot of times they all intertwine too. If you are deficient in magnesium or B vitamins, your body can't produce melatonin. Your body might not be able to go to sleep very easily or stay asleep very easily. So everything is correlated. Um, and I think it's important to realize okay, well, acknowledge that you have this, this anxiety over, over, you know, your medical diagnosis or over the history and then have action points of, well, how can I take more control? Um, I think that's super important. One other thing that you mentioned, which I think was really, really, really vital is you said, you know, you might feel you're a primary, but you're nervous, right? There's white coat syndrome. You're you're anxious every time a doctor comes into the room. I get it. So write those questions before you get there, because that way you have a list ready and you're able to go in being informed. Um, and that way, and ask those questions kind of before they do the physical exam, because that might also help them determine what they need to look further into to help you with your goals and your overall health. So the more information you actually provide to your primary care, your cardiologist, your dietitian, the more they're able to connect the dots and and understand your journey. Because when I'm, when I do my 90 minute comprehensive assessment on, on all my individual clients, um, I ask all these questions and, you know, it goes very fluid, but they don't realize that in my head, it's firing different things, right? Like I'll ask, you know, how's your bowel movements and how's how, like, how would you describe your water intake? Do you have, like, I ask all these different questions and in my head, it's kind of like this whole big web of okay, these are the risk factors. These are the things we need to work on. And it puts all these green lights. And that's what's happening with most practitioners who's been in practice for a while, because we have experience, we have the education and the knowledge. So the more information you give us, the more we're able to help you and also help answer your questions, reduce the anxiety and explain the why and, and give you empowerment versus fear in your medical condition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, to be honest, I would say 100% of the time when I go to my own appointments, even though I'm not necessarily nervous about them, I always forget to ask about something like 100% of the time. So especially if you have some nerves, I think those are some really um, great recommendations. And for people who aren't sure where to start, maybe they're feeling overwhelmed, I would say start with just gathering as much knowledge as you can, asking questions, um, reading, you know, about from reputable sources, you know, talking with your um, providers. And then from there to, to keep from getting overwhelmed, if there's maybe a few areas Areas that you're feeling like you would want to address, you know, just even just starting with one. So maybe you have kind of done a check-in with yourself or one of your providers, you've looked at maybe your sleep, exercise, what you're eating, stress levels, things like that. Um, you might just choose one to start with, set some small goals around, start to see some changes, feel good about it. We can always add on, um, but we don't want to try to make too many changes at once because it's just, it can be overwhelming. And then when we don't follow through with what we had hoped to, what ends up happening is we just get discouraged and then say, eh, you know, all right, forget this whole thing. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred. I couldn't agree more. I always work at like two to four goals per two week time period at most, because then we can address challenges. We can see how things are going, but also we're not looking to get to your goal in one month. And then your goals don't continue and get maintained. We're looking for long-term goals and long-term sustainability because with all heart health conditions, all health conditions in general, if you do something for a week or a month, you're not going to have a large impact. We're looking at making this sustainable so that we are preventing cardiovascular complications in one year, two years, five years for the rest of your life. And so super important to look at it as you don't need to change everything really quickly, even making one or two small changes, you should feel a difference. And then it empowers you to continue adding on until you're doing it majority Majority. Remember, you don't have to be perfect in any of these categories, but you do want to most of the time be implementing many things that work for you and that you can do long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with that. And the other important thing, um, I think, for this topic specifically is just being mindful of when some of that kind of anxious thinking is taking over. And probably the easiest way to do that is to start to monitor for the phrase, what if. So that's like our classic anxiety 
spiral phase, we call it, and it's very common with health related um, stress or concern. So it might sound something like, well, you know, I have a family history of, of, of heart attacks. Well, what if I have a heart attack? And then what if I have to leave my job because of that? And then what am I going to do with my house? And then what if we're out on the street? And it can, it, that's maybe sounds extreme, but in the mind, it goes that way very, very quickly. Um, and before you know it, you know, we're out on the street with nothing and none of that has actually happened. Um, so uh, some, I would say probably the most common kind of easiest to look for kind of anxious thought process is going to be that that what if thinking and you know the the faster that leaves the train station the the faster the train is going to take off and really kind of tumbleweed um, in that so I think just even if you're noticing it just even just kind of taking a pause and just telling yourself okay my anxious mind maybe is taking over I'm imagining worst case scenarios that have not happened. Um, you know, the chance of all the worst case scenarios that you come up with happening are, is very unlikely. Um, so I think really just being mindful of that as well, because that is very common with, with health concerns specifically. I think that's great advice. Yeah. Because sometimes we don't realize it and that's the issue when we're good at, and then that continues to spiral, spiral, spiral. And then we get into this very depressive state where we can't really return. So mindfulness is a big component to ensuring that you are, you're addressing it. I love that so much. Um, this was great. I really love this episode. Let me tell, let me know anything you want to kind of leave us with. Um, I want to make sure everyone's following you on Instagram at Dr. Julia Kogan and on your website for some even more great information, but anything you'd like to leave us before, um, we, we close this, the podcast. Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing I just want to say is no matter where you are, maybe you've already had a significant kind of cardiac event, maybe you have a family history, maybe you're just wanting to prevent that, any changes that you're making today moving forward are going to make a difference. So, you know, history, of course, is important, but it is never too late to improve your mood and work with further prevention of these things. So I would really encourage you just to be mindful of some of the things that we talked about today and it really applies to everyone, no matter where you're at, learning the, the why and, and how of things taking small actionable steps and then just kind of keeping an eye on any stress or, or anxiety that might be getting in the way of some of that. I love it. I love it so much. Thank you so much for being here and we'll talk again soon. Thank you.